Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And last week, we saw that in the New Testament, there were benefactors in the church. Some were leaders in the early church. I showed you an example that you don't usually hear about in Philemon. Church history tells us that he became a bishop. So he was somebody who did well in the outside world, and then he used those resources to help the church. That's a good thing. I also showed you that there were two women, Lydia and Phoebe, did well. They managed their business well. They helped the church too. Proverbs 31 women, I called them. If you're familiar with that proverb, you know. She manages the household well, and she's also like a merchant, so she takes care of both things. And I told you that my wife is kind of like that. She works in the business world, manages that well, manages her house well, hold well, and if she wasn't, I wouldn't say so, and then <laughs> manages things in the church well. And even before we became Christians, it was always like that. We worked really hard. When we first met, she helped me at the business. Just rolled up her sleeves, got right in there and worked. And then she put herself through college, worked a whole bunch of jobs to do that, got her master's degree, and then became a school teacher. And so she helped me at the business and then was a school teacher. I only had two jobs, so it's not a bad. I worked from home, our internet company, during the day. In the evenings, I would go teach my martial arts classes. And that was my routine. So this was all good. Until... Sophie, <laughs> until we had our daughter. And I'm not going to say what a lot of guys say, like, we became pregnant. No, we did not become pregnant. She became, <laughs> I had fun in the beginning, and the rest of it, she did the hard part, right? So not going to make that claim. She became pregnant, right? So we had to make some decisions here, all right? She got, like, whatever it was, six weeks from maternity leave, and she's not the kind of woman who's like, nah, I'm going to be a stay-at-home mom. She cannot do that, right? So I'm just going to say she's a hard worker, not that she can't sit still. But anyway, so I knew she's not, she's not going to stay home. She's going to go back to work. So what do we do? Well, we weren't a big fan of daycare, couldn't afford it anyway at that time. The business hadn't flourished yet. She needed her job, and we needed the dual incomes. So I came up with a solution. How hard could it be? <laughs> Every mom in the room <laughs> laughed. How hard could this be? Just a little baby. Like, whatever. I'll do it. How hard could it be? Very very, very difficult. So, I never understood that this one thing could bring so much joy in your life. Not the baby. The fact that the baby can feed itself. That, the joy in that was unbelievable. Because before they can do that, you can't get anything done. You're racing to get things done between naps. That's it. Just during the nap, you race, you get what you can get done. Then the mailman comes or something, bangs on the door, and then baby cries. You're going crazy. It's nuts. So what you do is you put him in the high chair, and you guys know this, but I'm just talking to the guys out there. It's not a good idea. Don't do this. So you put the baby in the high chair. I mean, watching a kid, being Mr. Mom, not a good idea. Put the baby in the high chair. That's correct. Buckle him in if you want. You got the tray there, and then you put, I don't know what they were. What were they called? The little little poofs, little things, treats, I don't know. So anyway, you put them all out, and then you demonstrate. That's how you teach, right? Like, see, do. Here, look. Ah, right? So the first move is, bat, 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 and then they just go everywhere. Great. So it just seems like months of this. It's grueling, and you're like, no, look, do, do what I do. And then here's what they do. They pick it up, and then they feed you. I'm like, I don't need it. Do it. And then they put it everywhere. It goes in all the holes except the mouth. They can get it in the ear, the nose, the hair, everywhere. But then finally, the day comes when they do it. And you're like, yes, sweet freedom. It's the most wonderful thing. And I'm calling my wife. She's like, I'm teaching. I work for a living. Hello. You know, don't call me. It's, you celebrate. Here's the other thing. Humility. Humility. You learn joy and humility. So one day, <laughs> knock at the door. Doesn't wake the baby up. That's good. Rush to the door. Package comes. I got a sign for it. Okay. But here's the thing. The guy's looking at me like, 
I can't really replicate the look. It's just like, like real weird. And I'm like, all right, you know what? I'm good, right? Zippers done. Everything, you know what's going on, guy? But anyway, it doesn't say anything. And even when he goes away, he's kind of like, whatever. So later, my wife Heather gets home, and I promptly give her the baby. It's yours, your shift. I'm out, right? So as soon as you step across the threshold, it's you. She pooped, but she did that when your foot hit. That's it. It's yours, right? So I'm done, right? So whatever. We get to talking, we're talking about our day, this, that, and the other thing. And I say, hey, this was really weird. I answered the door, got the package there, and to sign for it. But guy looked at me really weird, like really, really weird. And so she does, we've discussed this, the pastor look. Mm, when we do that to you, you mm, we're waiting for you to figure something out. And that was the case here. Mm, so she asked me a question. She says, well, let me ask you a question. When you answered the door, were you wearing that pink princess headband? <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I realized that this is just another thing that we've been talking about, that the Lord had used in our previous lives to prepare us, where Heather goes out and works a job, and I stay home with all the kids. That's what... <laughs> All right, the rest of the story, this is where we're looking at a lot of the pieces of the Bible that nobody ever looks at at all. We're putting it together in chronological-ish order for you. Last week, we looked at Isaiah chapters 1 through 6. Why? Because that is what happens during Uzziah's reign. It's during there. And we saw that 6, the beginning of 6, this is what happened in the year Uzziah died. So we're trying to Put these things in parallel for you, chronological order. So Isaiah is all the way over here, and he's got to come like back here, 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 the reign of like four kings. So I'm trying to put it together for you as best I can. So today, we're going to go back to 2 Kings 15 and 2 Chronicles 26. Uh, they do run in parallel-ish. And what you have here, if you pass... Uzziah in 2 Kings 15, you're going to get the accounts of a few other kings here. And it's weird because it'll say this king was king when Uzziah, in this year of his reign. It's like 52-year reign. It's a long time. So in the umpteenth year of his reign, this person was a king. But if you're reading it and thinking that it should be chronological, you're like, wait a minute. You just said Uzziah died. And now... This... So you got to read it like this. Meanwhile, in Israel... These things happen. So that's the way to think about it. So it's like a, a flashback, if you will, or something like that. So Judah and Israel, there's like a civil war going on here. There's a split kingdom since Rehoboam, Solomon's son. And so this is what's going on. And now the kings of Israel, they'll get their succession as they had in the past by assassination. It's not like a direct lineage. And so they'll go through a lot of kings faster it gets really confusing because it sounds really super redundant. So I'm just going to kind of overview this section for you. So Zechariah, another point of confusion. Which Zechariah is it? There's a lot of them. It's not the one book of Zechariah. It's a different one. So he reigns, but then this guy, Shalom, decides to assassinate him. And there's an interesting little thing here. Remember Jehu? He'll have kings, generations, four generations of kings after him. So it fulfills that prophecy. Not anymore. So now Shalom's there. Again, more assassination. Menahem assassinates him. He's a really bad guy. He attacks a town, and it says, it's gross, he rips open the pregnant women. So he's just really, 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 really evil, and they're going to get what they deserve here. So... You enter a guy, Tiglath-Phileser of Assyria. He's the king of Assyria. And this is where it gets really confusing. There's all these different nations surrounding them. So he pays him off. He gives him like 37, 32, 37 was right the first time. Tons of silver. Pays him off to make him go away. He dies, not assassination. Pekahiah becomes the next king. Same thing. Evil guy, assassination. And then you have Pekah or Peka. Son of Remaliah. You're following this? You got it. Good. All right. <laughs> and here, Hosea becomes king. And this is going to be the last king of Israel when they have their downfall. So we'll get back to him in a minute. Not today. Actually, a couple of weeks. So it says he's assassinated. But then it says 
Jotham, son of Uzziah, is king in Judah. So all those kings were in the north. This one's in the south. That's why it's confusing. You're like, what is going on? So Jotham is king. 25 years old. He reigned for 16 years. It doesn't say a whole lot about him. This is why 2 Chronicles 27 is kind of a short chapter. It's just about him, and that's it. Kind of breezes over it pretty quick. But then it says Ahaz becomes the next king of Judah in the south. I think I told you last week, Judah, Jerusalem. Jerusalem's a capital city there, so it's kind of synonymous. If we turn the page, 2 Kings 16.1. Ahaz, son of Jotham, began to rule over Judah in the 17th year of King Pekah, or Pekah's reign in Israel. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. He did not do what was pleasing in the sight of the Lord his God, as his ancestor David had done. Instead, he followed the example of the kings of Israel, even sacrificing his own son in the fire. If your version says, walk through the fire... Just that's what he's doing. He's making him pass through the fire. He's killing him. So we know that too. When we go to Second Chronicles, the parallel chapter, it says burning his sons, plural, in the fire. Not a good guy. In this way, he followed the detestable practices of the pagan nations the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. He offered sacrifices and burned incense at the pagan shrines and on the hills and under every green tree. So to summarize, what happens is there are two kings, the king of Aram, Reason, and you're going to have this king Pekah from Israel, son of Remaliah. They're going to join forces, and they're going to begin to attack him. They're going to attack Ahaz. So it's bad news. You've got two people coming after you. And so what he does, going back to that tiglath Phileser guy from Assyria, it says here that he just pays him to help him out. Right, to conquer these armies. And it says he attacks Damascus. So this is the capital of Aram. <clears throat> and then he decides to go visit him there. And when he's there, he takes note of the altar there. So this is like false foreign god worship. And he likes it. And he sends a model back to Uriah's priest, not the Uriah of David and Bathsheba. And this is way later. And he says, make this for me. You know, make these things, these worship things. He says, okay, and what happens is he begins removing, like, all the good things, all the, the, the worship that they're supposed to be doing, that's prescribed to them, that Solomon had set up, removing that and replacing it with the foreign stuff. So this is very evil to facilitate this foreign god worship. Now, if we turn to 2 Chronicles 28, it's in parallel, but it's a similar summary, but we get some different details, uh, which it gives you some insight as to what's going on here. He's losing big time. In one battle, one day, it says he loses 120,000 elite troops. Think about that. Think about that. Right? They don't have an A-bomb or something like that. You know? No. It's like hand-to-hand -hand combat stuff. Create 120,000 troops. And they take away 200,000 women and children. And they're going to bring them off to be captives. But something very interesting happens. So they're going back to their capital city, Samaria, and this prophet of the Lord, Oded, he kind of rebukes them. He says, whoa, 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 these are like your brothers and sisters. Remember the 12 tribes of Israel? This is 10 of them. You can't do this. You know, don't make these people slaves. That's the intention. So they agree. The leadership says, yeah, that's a good idea. We'll clothe them. We'll bandage them up and then send them back. They went to Jericho. So it just notes that, inserts that. Another thing is kind of interesting and that's why I like these parallel accounts, because the most probable reason that, that Ahaz pays the king of Assyria, those 37 tons of silver, is because it tells us in this chapter that the king of Assyria decides to attack him first. So he calls for help, he gets attacked, and then pays him off to go send him to Damascus. So it's no good. He's stripping things from the temple to make these payments. It's all bad. Second Chronicles 28-22. Even during this time of trouble, King Ahaz continued to reject the Lord. He offered sacrifices to the gods of Damascus who had defeated him. For he said, since these gods helped the kings of Aram, they'll help me too if I sacrifice to them. But instead, they, they led to his ruin and the ruin of all Judah. 
The king took the various articles from the temple of God and broke them into pieces. He shut the doors of the Lord's temple so that no one could worship there. And he set up the altars to the pagan gods in every corner of Jerusalem. He made pagan shrines in all the towns of Judah for offering sacrifices to other gods. In this way, he aroused the anger of the Lord, the God of his ancestors. The rest of the events of Ahaz's reign and everything he did from beginning to end are recorded in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. When Ahaz died, he was buried in Jerusalem, but not in the royal cemetery of the kings of Judah. Then his son, Hezekiah, became the next king. We will get to him later. There's going to be an awful lot on him. So lesson, do not name your kid Ahaz. That should be a takeaway from today. So I talked about Isaiah. Right? So we did that last week, but we concentrated on six chapters. Here we're going to mix them in. So we're going to do three, three books of the Bible that kind of go in parallel. You ready? Got it? You all right? You got it. Okay, hang in there. Buckle up. All right, so Isaiah, we're going to turn the page from six, seven, one. Look at this. When Ahaz, son of Jotham and grandson of Uzziah, ah, it's all coming together, was king of Judah, king Rezin of Syria, and king Pekah, son of Ramaliah, the king of Israel, set out to attack Jerusalem. Now you know that, right? However, they were unable to carry out their plan. The news had come to the royal court of Judah. Syria is allied with Israel against us. So the hearts of the king and his people trembled with fear, like trees shaking in a storm. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, take your son, Shear Jashub, your guess is as good as mine on the pronunciation, and go out to meet King Ahaz. You will find him at the end of the aqueduct that feeds water into the upper pool near the road leading to the field where cloth is washed. Very specific. Tell him to stop worrying. Tell him he doesn't need to fear the fierce anger of those two burnt-out embers, King Reason of Syria and Pekah, or Pekah, son of Ramaliah. So he continues on, tells them not to worry about it, in some kind of poetic language, and then says, unless your faith is firm, I cannot make you stand firm. And it continues, Isaiah 7.10, later the Lord sent this message to King Ahaz, ask the Lord, your God, for a sign of confirmation, Ahaz, make it as difficult as you want, as high as the heaven or as deep as the place of the dead. The king refused. No, he said, I will not test the Lord like that. Then Isaiah said, listen, well, you royal family of David, isn't it enough to exhaust human patience? Must you exhaust the patience of my God as well? All right then, the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, or behold, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Sound familiar? A lot of you know those verses. They should be familiar. But if you didn't before, now you know the context behind it. Interesting. Now, here's the thing, and this is going to get really cool. If we go to the Gospels, we see a quote of that in the very first chapter. So you have a very long, lengthy genealogy for Jesus, and then Matthew 1.18. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And you have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to his son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. Just interesting. Side note, again, that is the Greek Old Testament being quoted. Important. We'll do more of that at Bible study if you want. But here's the thing. <laughs> Joseph. 
So just, guys, like, let's just, I'm going to preach to you for a minute. <laughs> you're engaged. You're abstaining. You're waiting, right? You should do that. Wait until you're married. But your fiancé comes up to you, and she says, hey, I'm pregnant. What? No, 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 but it's all good because it was the Holy Spirit. <laughs> all right. I don't blame them, right? We're that's nice. We're going to break this off. Like, <laughs> but then the angel comes, right? And even though I, know, I just don't know about you, I've got to be honest here. I'll be like, okay, Gabriel, right. Is that the mailman's name? Like Holy Spirit? <laughs> you know, really? You know what I mean? I don't know. So Joseph, he's a pretty faithful guy. Like, that's a big ask, isn't it? Right? I don't, you know, he came in a dream. and everybody, Could have been a dream. He could have gone through like another stage. We've seen these kinds of things, right? Whether it's like the wool on the floor or whatever. You know, you got, you got to show me, Lord. This is, he doesn't even ask for a sign. It's kind of crazy. Like, okay. I don't know. Better guy than me. But here's the thing. <laughs> it's about faithfulness. So Mary was faithful. Joseph was faithful. And now this is an extreme example, but let's bring it to us for a minute. Let's just bring it to us. And again, women, I was preaching to the guys, you can't use the Holy Spirit thing. That's not what I'm talking about, okay? So it's not a good excuse. <laughs> we need to be faithful in both directions. We need to be faithful, and I'll add, we need to realize in practical ways that there may be some unseen things going on in the realms of our spouses, things we don't understand. We need to think about that perhaps before oh, we volunteer to be Mr. Mom, guys. <laughs> Consider what they're doing. You see, truly being faithful means we can be trusted with things when we're not seen and when we are not seen. It also means that there are things that aren't seen that we should really appreciate. And it should be like this in all of our relationships. So some practical examples. I got confirmation on this one this morning. I had to ask someone who was in the military. You got military, <laughs> ministry, and marriage. They're all kind of like each other. Anyway, <laughs> but military. Let's say you're an aviator, you're on a plane. You have to trust that the people in their positions, their respective positions, are doing what they're supposed to be doing, that they're being faithful in their job. But you also have to be faithful in your position. That's a good relationship. It's good teamwork. Ministry. This happens all the time. We call it staying in your lane, right? So everybody's always pointing at everybody else. No, no, no. You just do what you do and have faith that the other people are doing what they should be doing. Don't doubt it. Just move forward. If you do, <laughs> maybe you need another church. Right? So that's what you have to do. So you have to have faith that the pastor is doing what he's supposed to do. I have faith that the people are making the coffee, cooking the food. I go annoy them before the service. I always annoy them, take them away from their work. But I'm not saying, hey, you know, did you put the right amount of scoops in the coffee machine? Or, I don't need to know. I just trust that they're, they're going to do that. Don't get micromanaging, right? But you have to have faith in a good team. You have to have trust, but you also need to be trusted. And this is how it is in a good marriage. So if you're out there working, don't come home from work and then tell the person who's not how to do their job or what they did wrong. You don't understand. The headband, even wait on that until it's funny. That's okay. <laughs> but also don't tell the person working what they should do. Faith and trust in all your roles and responsibility. All right relationships require faith. Faith that the other person is doing what they're supposed to be doing when no one is watching. Now, a marriage, I have found, is a picture of how a person behaves in relationships. You can look at the marriage to see how they're doing other things, probably. When they're used to them, when they get used to them, we get a picture of their faithfulness. We also get a picture of what their relationship with God is probably like when we look at the marriage. You see, 
We often neglect the ones we should be faithful to who are doing these things in the unseen realms for us. Sometimes, while chasing after things that we can see, not being faithful. Maybe they look good to us according to the world. Ahaz was unfaithful. Second Chronicles 28, 19. The Lord was humbling Judah because of King Ahaz of Judah. For he had encouraged his people to sin, and he had been utterly unfaithful to the Lord. Ahaz needed to trust that even though he couldn't see it, the Lord was moving. The Lord was working. And likewise, we need to trust, even if we can't see it, that God is working. God is moving. We need to have that type of faith, especially in our times of distress or distrust. We can't put our faith as Ahaz did in foreign gods, in other things. It has to be in God alone. He committed adultery with the immediate. We can't have any other go-tos other than God, but here's the thing. What do we go to instead of God? What are our go-tos? Talked about this problem, having the right heart to hear from the Lord. People are often in the world more than they are the Word. Remember the seeds last week? That's why it can't get in there. That's the key to hearing from Him. We go to so many other things. I find it very ironic that, like, in God we trust is the motto on money. We must be loyal in both our relationships with each other and with God. We looked at James last week. Let's continue there. James 4.4. 4. You adulterers. I talked about eat, like English translations kind of making it easier for us. In Greek, it says, you adulteresses. Feminine. So even for the men in the church, it's incredibly hard language. Don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate, that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. And he gives grace generously, as the scriptures say. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Proverbs 3.34, again, the Greek Old Testament being quoted. So humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. There it is again, just like we saw last week. We can't have a loyalty that is divided. We cannot have any other go-tos except God. Now, I know that's hard because sometimes you can't see him. Sometimes you can't hear him, but connecting this week and last week, you need to be in this, not the world, right? So if you're listening to whatever, the news, whatever it is, all this crazy stuff, or looking at stuff you shouldn't be looking at on the internet, how, how do you expect to hear from God with all that noise in the way? you got to get rid of that. That's the key. That's the key. Be in this. Faith is believing what is not seen. Hebrews 11.1. 1. And if that says 1.1, 1, 1, that was my typo, not Robert's. It's 11.1. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. 2 Corinthians 4.18. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we can see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. Was I right about that? 11.1. Yeah. My fault. 
So here's the thing. I kind of had an interesting conversation following a Devo staff meeting last week. And the idea, Carolee brought it forward, was that, like, would you ever take a bullet for somebody? I mean, we hear that all the time. People, like, pretty loose with it. They say, oh, yeah, I'd take a bullet for you. You know, think about that. But the point was Jesus took a bullet for all of you, for all of us. Wow. This is amazing. So just a little side note here because I want you guys to understand our church culture, who we are, what we believe in. We're a Bible-believing church. This is primary. Christ-centered church. That's what C3 stands for now. Christ is the head of this whole thing, not me, not pastor-centered church. Right? So this is the program guide. And that's it. We don't need anything more than that. No. God's Word says we shouldn't have anything more than that or anything less. That's it. That's it. That's good enough. Here's the thing. Denominations. Paul's worst nightmare. Paul's worst nightmare. Reason for writing Romans, Ephesians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians-ish. Fracture in the church. That this idea, Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 8, this idea that Christians would start arguing about things outside the gospel and then dividing. So the primary things, 1 Corinthians 15, read it. Those are the primary things in the gospel. That's it. He defines the gospel in short there. There are some other things that are very important, but some of the other stuff, eh. So for example... The first council in Christianity, Acts 15, it's created because all the original believers are Jewish. And so they're like, ah, oh, the Gentiles, non-Jewish people, they need to get circumcised and do all the things that we do. And so they have a council about it. James is presiding, interestingly enough, at this council. And by the power of the Holy Spirit and with some intelligence, they say, no, not so much. No, Pharisees, go away. They don't have to do that. That's it. And so they send them with these letters to the churches. They're happy. Hey, good. I don't have to get circumcised to be a Christian. Yeah, our numbers are going to grow, right? So they go and they're happy about it. This is what Galatians is really all about. If you read Galatians, he even recounts the thing in there. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. You know, you're not under the law anymore. You don't have to do that. Fools, right? Don't let anyone convince you of that. If they do, they're cursed. Strong language in Galatians. So that's what that's all about. Think about it, right? So this is really important, though. Really, really important because within that list, don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. So think about it. You don't have to get circumcised. You don't have to follow the law of Moses. But things that are strangled from the blood, you're not supposed to be eating the blood, and meat sacrificed to idols. So these sacrificial systems, you know, they sacrifice an animal. Don't eat that meat. Here's a problem. You don't know what it is in the meat market, right? So you don't, hey, was this meat sacrificed? I don't know. I bought it from that guy and that guy and that guy. Supply chain, whatever. So they don't know. So what Paul goes out of his way to say, even though it came down in a letter from James, Jesus' brother, the head of the mother church at the time in Jerusalem, it's one of the four things that Gentiles do have to do. What does Paul say? Don't worry about it. Think about that. It's not the gospel. So read 1 Corinthians 8, Romans 14. Don't divide over that. Don't just eat it in private if you want to eat it or whatever, or just eat vegetables if it causes the other person to stumble. I want you to think about that for a second. This comes from the mother church. He could have been legalistic about it. He could have gone, yeah, you see that? James said, you need to follow it. He didn't. He didn't. For the sake of unity and the gospel, he said, forget it. Like, just focus on Jesus, people. But think about, if you've been a Christian for a long time, all the nitpicky things Christians divide about. Why we have to have another church. and then another, There are 40,000 some odd denominations. It's not just two, three. Isn't that crazy? That's crazy. That's how divided we are. Can't agree on anything. Christians are like our own worst enemies in this sense. It's horrible. Horrible. So here, I want you guys to know this, and if it's your first time, this is really important. On the website, it said non-denominational, right? That was really important. It said big letters on Google, non-denominational. So we are here. And so on any given Sunday, I can have an Orthodox believer here, I love you. Catholic believer here, I love you. Do you believe? My dad was Catholic. Before he died, week before he died, knew he was going to die. What do you think, Gene? You know the Bible really well. What do you think? I said, do you love Jesus? 
Is he your Lord? Yes. You believe he's God? Yes. I'll see you in heaven. Nothing can separate us from that. Nothing. Oh, they have a pope. and they have the, Yeah, Protestants have a lot of stupid things too. You worship Martin Luther. Get over it. It's true. And by the way, James, he said that James was garbage. He wouldn't teach it at his university. Imagine a pastor. That's heresy. Imagine a pastor saying that. It's nothing to be proud of. Look it up. I'm not lying. Right? So some denominations, oh, nobody's getting into heaven but us. So you want to know, and this is the important thing, we are a non-denominational church. It's something I'm very passionate about. Very passionate about. Because what a lot of churches do is they just remove the denomination from the side. Right? That's it. But they don't change anything else. And I have friends, they're looking for churches, and they're like, oh, it's non-denominational. I'm like, nope, it's not. What? No, it is. It's non-denominational. I said, okay, pick another denomination, like Catholic, and ask that person, because it's a Baptist church, if the Catholic's saved. If they say no, they're not non-denominational. And by the way, that's cruel. That's really evil. It's mean. You're not saved? What? Who gets to judge that? Unbelievable how far we've gotten away from what Paul wrote. Unreal. So you guys just have to know that. And here's the thing. So I've been thinking a bit on this devotional. I know I went that way, but it's okay. It's important for you guys to know. So if you're church shopping or you're out there looking for churches, ask the pastor where he went to seminary and what the denomination was, and then ask him what he's changed to become non-denominational. Or what can I do and still be saved? Ask him that question. You're going to find out quick. Very few non-denominational churches. So I look at other churches. I have friends from all different denominations, priests and different things, and we engage in discussion. We're not... We talk to one another about the differences. Ultimately, do you love Jesus? Yes. I love Jesus. Good. We're both good. See you in heaven. That's it, right? But I like to learn. Like, why do you do that? Why do you do that? Why is that in your service? And sometimes I'm like, eh, I don't think so. Not so much, right? But some things are kind of cool. And one of the things that I did, I grew up Catholic, we were the Stations of the Cross. I don't know about other denominations where they have them. I'm not sure. I know like uh, the Orthodox Church has that iconography and all, all that stuff. And I think they go a little too far with it. But depictions. But in a Catholic church, at least the ones that I grew up in, you're going to see a cross there. And it's going to have Jesus dead on it or dying on it. And that's interesting, right? But in the modern prosperity church, and I had a friend whose dad did this. When he was a boy, he, he brought home a cross. He got a cross, and Jesus was on it. The guy took Jesus off the cross, and he goes, he's not on there anymore. I know. <laughs> but it's, like, good to think about that. You know what I mean? Like, what he did. What is that? Hyper-prosperity gospel. We can't, nothing bad can happen. We deny what Jesus said, which was, if you want to follow me, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. This is going to happen to you, too. So, and I think about that. I was asked about crosses. Like, what I'm like, I don't know. I try to do everything with the projectors. There's no real reason why we don't have a cross. It's obviously not that we don't believe in the crucifixion. We do. But I started thinking about that practice, right? Walking in there and you're like, wow. You can't escape that reality, what Jesus did for us. And then you do the stations. And this is where basically, you know, like the, the, all the torture Jesus went through. And you, you look, it's on the side of the walls. So you can't escape it. And you're looking at it, and you're like, whoa. And then sometimes they have the apostles and how they're martyred and all these things. It's like, really, when you think about it, you go into certain churches, there's like death everywhere, like all over the place. And I'm like, you know, for some modern Christians, that's not really a bad thing. Right? You get people coming, I didn't like the music, I didn't like this. So maybe we'll put up the stations of the cross. Right? You know what I mean? People will come in, well, I'm shopping for the church with the right coffee and the right music, and it's got to be like this, and the pastor went five minutes long, or this week it was the youth pastor. Oh, I can sing better than that worship leader. Let's find another church where there's like a better show. Have we totally forgotten what this whole thing is all about? What's the gospel? Right? Most of us kind of know, like, the basics of the gospel. Jesus what? Suffered, died, and was buried. Third day, rose again to fulfill the scriptures. Right? And he ascended into heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. Basics. It's how it begins. <laughs> we can't have the resurrection without the crucifixion. It doesn't work. 
And Jesus gave us no promises that anything would be easy, nor did any of the apostles. They were almost all martyred. Hello? You know? And sometimes people would sit there and they'll look at me like, man, this guy's crazy. I can't wait for him to stop. What? Jesus did that for you, but you can't listen to me talk about it for too long. But that's where the modern church is. Now, if you're new here, that's not where the core of C3 is. That is not where our leadership is. It's not where the Bible study group is. It's not. We are not there. We are not there. That's what real church, real people is. It's not like, oh, we can just do whatever we want. <laughs> no. So I'm going to give you a little context, and then we'll close with these scriptures. I want these to be on your mind as we leave this morning. Better God's words than mine. Uh, so First Peter, <laughs> again, read the whole thing sometimes. Read all, all, all sometimes, all five chapters, straight through. Did that for a Bible study once. I think it took me 25, 30 minutes. Right, so even if it takes you 40 because you don't talk fast like a New Yorker like me, you'll get, you know, it'll be like worth it. You know, you'll make it the 40 minutes devoting your time to God. <laughs> so anyway, the context here, First Peter, they're suffering. Right, so depending on where you put the letter, Christians are being burned alive by Nero. That's what's going on. Fiery trials. That's what he's alluding to. It's really, really bad. They're dying. Peter says this. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is more precious than mere gold, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for everyone in the sound of my voice. I hope that you soften their hearts so that your word can penetrate down deep within them and cause them to just bring out a harvest of fruit 30, 60, 100 times. They can bear fruit, make disciples, bring people into the light, be a vehicle for your love, your grace, your mercy. I thank you for the church, the body of Christ. Be with us as we go out this week. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.